Brethren, in Leviticus 23, we have God giving some instructions to the ancient Israelites. Let's, let's turn to it. Leviticus 23. And let's read from verse 23. <clears throat> It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer <clears throat> an offering made by fire. Unto the Lord. Now note brethren. This feast occurs. In the seventh month. Is that significant? We know God uses the number seven. As a symbol of completion. Or perfection. So what's going to be. Completed or perfected. That a trumpet has to be sounded. But today brethren. We want to look at what. Blowing a trumpet. On this day in the seventh month signifies. And if you want a title. To the sermonette. It is the greatest events. In the history. Of the universe. Now brethren. A trumpet is a strident instrument. Its pitch and its tone forces you to look in the direction of the sound. And in ancient Israel, it heralded something significant. Whether called to arms, an enemy is a threatening, prepared to defend the country, or to signal one of those holy days that are mentioned in, in Leviticus 23. But beyond that, brethren, what significance did it have, if any at all? Wasn't that all just a Jewish thing that was done away when Christ came? Well, let's see. Let's go way back to the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 8. Revelation 8. And... <clears throat> Verse 1 says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour, half an hour long. And I saw seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So apparently they're going to blow these trumpets. Let's drop down to verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound, to blow these trumpets. And verse 7, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third path of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Is that something significant? Have we ever seen this before? And verse 8, and the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning uh, with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. Is that significant? And he said, a great mountain burning with fire. Could be uh, a volcano, like Mount Krakatoa, that was in the sea. And if you go and read on YouTube how what happened when it exploded? Or it could be a meteorite coming in from space that crashed into the sea. A verse 9, it says, And the third angel, and the third part of the, the creatures, etc., uh, in the sea, died. And the third part of the ships in the sea were destroyed. At verse 10, it says, And the third angel sounded again, blue trumpet, and there fell a star from heaven, a meteorite this time, burning as a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers 
and upon the fountains of waters. So it could be a comet that breaks up when it comes in. And you can read the rest until verse 13. Make a note of it. And let's go down to chapter 9. It says, And the fifth angel sounded. So they're blowing their trumpets in a succession. And I saw a star fall from heaven. Now this star is an angel who has come down, because it says he, to him, was given uh, the key of the bottomless pit. And you can take a note of it until uh, verse 5. Make a note of that. And you can go read it when you get home. And let's drop down to verse 13. It says, and the sixth angel sounded. So we have a sequence. Six angels now. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Uh, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And again, you can read, take a note of it until verse 15. And let's turn to Revelation 11. And you can read all the way down from there, even chapter 10, all the way to 11, brethren. It has details of the event and determine, are these things significant? Are they concluding something? And let's go to Revelation eleven fifteen, and here's what it says. And the seventh angel sounded. Seventh, seven angels. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Is that a significant event? Has it ever happened before? No. This is an announcement of something that will take place. But part of it is not yet fulfilled. The announcement is made, but part of this is not yet fulfilled. What is that part? Let us go to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And let's read from verse 15. Paul writing, he said, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede those who are asleep, those who have died. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with what? The trump or the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, referring to Jesus Christ. So the Feast of Trumpets, brethren, signals the completion of two of the most significant events in the history of the universe. First is the return of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, those who are Christ's at his return. The rest of the first fruits. Along with those who are alive, who are changed instantly. So brethren, is Christ's return something to celebrate? Is that why God ordained it to be a feast? Is our resurrection and change to eternal life something to celebrate? I would think so. That would be the greatest thing that ever happened to you in your entire life. And I would think that that is a reason to celebrate. Are these events greater than an alert to ancient Israelites that an enemy is approaching? I would think so. The seven trumpets would reveal things that never happened in our lifetimes and in the lifetimes of most of humanity. The times when these huge rocks would have fallen from space, probably nobody was around or not very many people would have seen them. So brethren, is the Feast of Trumpets done away? Well, it can't be because Christ hasn't come yet. We haven't been changed from mortal to immortal. 
So it can't be, did the Jews or the ancient Israelites know this? No, they didn't. To them, it was just as I mentioned before. And again, brethren, is it coincidence that these events occur in the seventh month, which signifies completion? I don't think it could be a, 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 a coincidence because the events are completion of something that had been predicted from way back when. So yes, brethren, because the Feast of Trumpets signifies the return of Jesus Christ, also the resurrection of those who have died in Christ and their change to spirit beings, sons of God, if you wish, along with those who are alive and who look forward to his return. I think that makes these two events the greatest events that humanity would ever have witnessed. And it is a reason and a day for celebration, brethren. Not something that is done away because these things have not yet occurred. Now on a day like today, huh, we normally take up an offering. Let us turn to Deuteronomy 16. And let's read verse 16. Deuteronomy 16, it says, Three times or three seasons in a year shall all your meals appear before the Lord. In the place which he shall choose, in the feast of unleavened bread, in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Now, the feasts in the seventh month, they were all bundled with the Feast of Tabernacles, because people were traveling and it was a, a festive time. They didn't cease because uh, you had the, the, the Feast of the Fast coming up. It was all a festive time. So all of these come in the seventh month, giving them a special significance. But why should we give God an offering? There are a number of reasons, brethren, but first of all, because giving is an attribute of the God family. And you can make a note of John 3.16, and we should know this by heart. It says, because God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. And what did he give? His only begotten son. That whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So he gave his son that we could get everlasting life. You can't give more than that. And let's turn to Revelation 2.17. Like I said, it is an attribute of the God family. Revelation chapter 2. And verse 17. It says... He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will what? Give. I will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name written, which no man knows save he who receives it. And drop down to verse 20. Six, it says, and he who overcometh and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I, what? Give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Verse 27, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken. Even as I have received of my father, and note verse 28 again, and I will give him the morning star. Giving is an attribute of the God family. And as sons of God, children of God, he is letting us learn that, understand that, by practice. There are certain things you can't know except you do them by practice. You can't play a musical instrument except you practice it. And let's go to Deuteronomy, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8 this time. Deuteronomy 8, 
Deuteronomy chapter 8. And let's read verses 17 and 18. Uh, jump back up to verse 16, uh, sp speaking specifically about the experience of the Israelites. Uh, I fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers didn't know, that he might humble you and that he might prove you to do, to do you good at the latter end. And you say in your heart, after you've come into the land that you've gotten, etc., you say in your heart, my power and my might, my skills, my business acumen has gotten me this wealth. Verse 18. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Note again. He gives you the power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant that he swore with his father. So God gives us the power, brethren, to get wealth. It doesn't come from some innate ability that we have. He gives us the power to get wealth. First of all, you have health. If you don't have health, you can't have wealth. You could be blind and deaf and dumb and have your brain malfunctioning. So he gives you the power to get wealth. And let's look at Haggai. Haggai chapter 8. It says, the silver is mine, God speaking now, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. So the things that we use to create wealth, he said they're mine. And he merely mentioned silver and gold because that perhaps were the most uh, used metals in that time. But the diamonds and the emeralds and the rubies and the pearls and the sapphires, they're mine. And today we could perhaps go and say the copper and the zinc and the tungsten and the 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 the, the, uh, the metals that they and the, that they use to, to to make these electronic devices to make these long-lasting batteries. All these are mine. So whatsoever we use to create wealth belongs to God. So giving him is to him is just a token. Of our thankfulness. So we give to God firstly because we're children of God and members of the God family. We give to God because He first gave to us, gave us life. And remember what He plans to give us in the future immortality, perfection, political power, and a royal status. Giving all that worthy. So, this is why we give. Because today is a day of celebration. And we give to God because we are learning to be like God. And we are learning to extend some of his attributes.